Hello, and welcome to another edition of 2D Animation um, Creation with me, uh, Scott Claus from CG Spectrum. And as always, if anybody's out there right now, if you can let me know if you can hear, if you can see okay, that's always helpful. And um, then we'll get started. Today I'm going to be doing some 2D animation stuff. I'm going to be drawing some monsters and uh, talking about the process of animation and some of the processes I've gone through in a scene that I'm currently working on. So some of the processes I've gone through in a scene that I'm currently working on. So um, yeah, so sit back and relax and you can uh, watch me create a scene or even better still, if you're out there and you're interested, uh, feel free to ask questions and uh, anything you'd like to chat about, assuming anyone's out there, um, go ahead and uh, feel free to ask me any questions at any time, and I will try to answer them and talk about uh, some of the processes I go through, or animation in general, or anything that uh, you're interested in at all. Um, but I will be here for the next two hours drawing and talking, and uh, feel free to chime in at any time. So today, what I'm going to be working on is a project with a superhero character that is battling a monster. And I decided to do something a little bit different. The last couple of weeks, I've just been doing some real basic drawing. But today, I thought I'd actually go through the entire process of um, animation as far as the creation of a scene like this, something that I'm working on. Uh, again, just for fun. This is just for laughs. But uh, I thought I'd just go through the whole process and give anyone who's interested a little bit of an overview of what goes into doing something like this. So first of all, I'm just going to play the scene, um, just this one character, and then I'll talk about it some more. But first of all, here, just check it out. So this is what my character is doing, uh, just doing a leap in the air, and then kind of a stab with a blade, and then has this stick uh, in his other hand that he's using to parry. There's a lot more to the scene. I'll share that in a minute, but I just wanted to give you just a quick sneak preview of what it is I'm working on. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's gone into it so far. And then I'll show you everything else that's going on in the scene. So first off, um, like I said, the inspiration for this, uh, well, I'm an old fan for, of Wally Wood. He was a mad comic book artist, a mad magazine artist from the 1950s. He did a lot of superhero stuff too, but he uh, did satires of superhero stuff in the 1950s for Mad Magazine when the, the magazine was just starting out. And um, one of the things that he did would, was parody the actual superheroes that he worked on. Um, and so one of the things that I really enjoyed was his parody of Batman and Robin, which he called... Uh, Bat Boy and Ruben. Actually, he didn't write these. Uh, Larry Kurtzman, I believe, Larry Kurtzman wrote them, and he drew them, and then somebody else inked them. But uh, I just love this style. I just think it's really funny. And I noticed somebody actually made a, an animated piece out of this uh, recently, within the last year. Somebody did a, a nice little short. So if you look it up, Bat Boy and Ruben animated video, um, you'll see a cartoon of this, and it really lends itself well to cartooning. But I really like the... Uh, sardonic style of it. The uh, colors, the way it's kind of satirical and everything's a little bit over the top and extreme and a little bit grotesque, um, but I like that too. I think it's fun. So that was one of my inspirations. I just love the masks that they wear and the way it uh, articulates their eyes. I love the gloves they wear. It articulates their fingers, which dancers do with gloves sometimes. And then Wally Wood was just all about articulation and um, interesting poses and nice silhouettes and obviously dark uh, shading and light. So that was a big influence on my style um, when I was a kid and I still use it today. And that was just one of the influences. Another one from my childhood was Dexter from the video game Space Ace created by Don Bluth. And I found this on DeviantArt. This is, I'm not sure who the artist is, sorry, I can't give credit for it, but uh, this is Dexter, the young version of Space Ace. He 
he pushes, I can't even remember, he pushes, I've played this thing about a thousand times. He pushes something on his watch and he becomes Space Ace, who's a big, hunky, himbo, uh, space fighter. But most of the time he's, or a lot of the time he's Dexter, a gorky, uh, scrawny kid. But I really liked his design. It's kind of Disney, but with a little bit of a cynical, sarcastic, campy edge to it, um, which I always think is fun. And then the idea that he turns into a dark version for a brief sequence in Space Ace. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's great. You can watch playthroughs of it on YouTube. And it's a lot of fun just to watch it as a cartoon. But uh, for a while, he turns into the dark version of his character. And um, I like that, too. I like that there's this dark version of uh, the good guy character. And so that was another inspiration. Another one uh, was this character from the movie Wizards from the 70s, going way back now, but some people still know about this. Uh, Ralph Bakshi created a, he calls it a family film. <laughs> he called it, well, he still calls it a family film, but he created a film called Wizards in the 1970s after he'd had a lot of success with doing adult cartoons, which aren't really that adult, not by today's standards, but they were adult for that time. He created, uh, he was trying to create something a little more family friendly. So he came with a fantasy film and he was a big fantasy film fan that was kind of based on, well, depending on who you talk to, Hollywood and uh, this other 70s cartoonist, Von Baudet, 60s, 70s cartoonist. And um, that's a whole other story. But the point is, I really liked the character designs. I didn't know anything about any of that. Um, I just thought that the designs were really cool. But what, um, what I'm pulling from this is the big floppy feet. So it was the 70s. Uh, and so everybody was wearing bell, bell bottoms. And so a lot of the characters in the Wizards and even in Space Ace, they've got these big floppy bell bottoms feet. And I, I think it's funny. I think it's cool. Uh, I'm not sure if it's that relevant. I don't know if anybody gets the joke of it, but uh, but I think it's funny. And so it's, it's a style that I've been drawing in for a long time, these big floppy um, feet, cartoony feet. Again, it just makes it easier to articulate and it gives it a little more character. And it gives it that kind of campy, silly feel that I, I really like. And then the last uh, influence that I had as far as the drawing of this character that I'm doing um, was this dark version of Peter Pan. It's in the movie, but it's not in it for very long. But he's just briefly looking down at something the kids i think he's on top of the house and he's looking down and the way the street light catches him makes him look kind of sinister like he's wearing a mask and uh, i always thought that looked really cool so those were the influences that i used to come up with a character who would look something like this now this is a rough drawing of this character eventually i'm going to do a cleanup of this probably for next time or maybe even today i'll do like a quick cleanup of one of the frames from this and show you what it'll look like when it's in color. Um, but this is just a clean up, cleaned up rough of the character design. So you can see what the character is eventually going to look like. So I had a character design. I played with the character a little bit. I've drawn this character before, so it wasn't anything new to me. Um, but uh, the specifics of you know what it was the character would be wearing and things like that, I worked out. But um, then the next thing that I did was I looked for some reference. I wanted to have this character doing something action-oriented, something sort of martial arts related. And uh, there's some great footage out there for reference of people doing these very articulated moves that are just great for animation reference. There's tons of that stuff out there. So uh, I went on YouTube and I looked around and what I came up with um, was a one long sequence of footage, which I then condensed into something a little bit shorter. So here's a reference video of what I used and I just cut it so that uh, it was just the jump and spin and then uh, this pose, this really dramatic stopping pose. And um, that's what I use as a basis for starting this character. So now that you've seen the reference, um, take a look at what I did with it again. And you can see that I took a lot of the stuff from the animation reference and then I uh, actually improvised some of it and 
you know, add a lot of squash and stretch. I'll go through that in a minute. Um, but if I move this over here a little bit and I bring the video back up, maybe you can see how I used the reference. I did not go one for one with the character, um, meaning I didn't rotoscope it uh, because if you rotoscope something, it's going to look kind of uncanny valley like. Um, speaking of Ralph Bakshi, he did a lot of rotoscoping with Lord of the Rings when he made that film in the 1970s. Uh, in 1978, actually, I was there. <laughs> I remember it very well. And he uh, didn't have the budget to actually do a fully animated film in a traditional sense. And so he decided to rotoscope by drawing over actual frames and then laying over character faces and, and details uh, on stuff that had already been acted out in live action. And so uh, that is how that film got its look. It wasn't anything new when Bakshi did it. Uh, Snow White was rotoscoped, Sleeping Beauty. Um, the character of Snow White was rotoscoped, was drawn over uh, live action footage to create that character. And Sleeping Beauty, uh, the Prince and Aurora, uh, the lead characters, they were definitely rotoscoped. And so it, it, it wasn't anything new, but Depending on who you talk to, it's a bit of a cheat. Uh, some people think if you're not drawing something fully by hand, fully rendering it using your artistic skills, and if you're just tracing something, then you're actually cheating. And uh, I, I tend to agree. <laughs> um, I, I just don't think it looks as interesting when you rotoscope something one for one as when you uh, actually animate it. It just it shows your skills as an animator instead of showing your ability to trace. So I'm gonna get rid of this. So, um, so I started off by just using it as reference the same way the Disney animators would do it. Um, looking at key poses, I went through the footage and I found all the key extreme poses in the scene and then uh, created my key poses from that. So if I pull this up here and uh, focus on the hero character in the, in the timeline, you'll see that there are these red and blue lines, um, red and blue ticks. I'll pull myself out of the way here so you can see it. Um, you'll see these red and blue lines, little tick marks next to the frames in Toon Boom in the timeline. And those red ones are the ones that I started off with. Um, in Toon Boom, you have the ability to isolate just the keys and play those. So I'll do that now. I'll just step through this by looking only at the key poses. So these are the key poses that I chose based on that reference that you saw. So I just looked at the footage, went through it frame by frame and chose these key poses and roughed out. You can see some of them are more rough than others and some of them are not even finished. They're just placeholder drawings. And then some of them are a little more clean. So like that one, uh, I would use that as my first drawing to kind of set the tone. What does this character actually look like? Uh, in the real world, you'd have a model sheet with every conceivable pose of this character. Well, I've drawn this character before, so I kind of know the proportions and things. Um, so I just wanted to set the tone and then I'll, at some point I'll clean this one up and then I'll clean up probably this one or maybe even this one because it's kind of a fun pose. And that will further set the tone of what this will look like when it's actually done. And whether or not it's gonna to have tones and highlights, which would be awesome, but I don't know if I'm up to the task, um, that remains to be seen. But uh, this isn't a very long scene. I specifically chose an action that was short and zippy and fun uh, so I can do it live and complete this thing. And then hopefully in a week or so, you'll see how this looks when it's done. So that was a general action that I had. And those are the basic keys that I used. Now, uh, an important factor to consider is I didn't just start animating. Uh, I actually used a ground plane that I got from a layout that I built. No, I didn't build it. I stole it. I'm just going to be honest. Um, I grabbed a background online. When I'm done with this, I'll probably make my own background out of this, but I just wanted something temporary, uh, just which is what you do in a real film. You'd have a temporary layout that you would use while you're working, and then the background painters are doing their magic in another department. 
So this is just a temporary layout that shows where the ground plane is, what the perspective is. And so I use, just use that for a starting point. And then again, I'll go back and tailor it and make it look how I want eventually. But for our purposes now, it's fine. So now if I play this, you'll see that the characters actually, you know, in the environment. And um, so I use that as a kind of a placeholder for where the character is going to stand. I may end up moving the character's placement a little bit. It looks like he's not quite completely locked to the ground in the first couple frames, the uh, first little bit of it. So I might fix that later, but at least I have a rough idea. So that was what I used when I was um, going through the keys. So again, I'll just go through the keys really quickly. And you can see the initial poses that I started out with. And this is again, based on the footage. I looked at the footage and I went, oh, that's an extreme when the character's up at the top of the frame, that's another extreme when it's down on the ground. And then based on those keys and just flipping between them as I'm doing right now, I came up with things like, oh, I'm going to squash the character when he's down on the ground, just really flatten him uh, much more than the character was in the reference. And, uh, and then um, add a little more character. So like I raised his foot and obviously I gave him a knife and then I kind of created this idea of him going for a stab, even though that wasn't really in the reference. I had the pose in the reference, but not that actual bit of business. And then the spinning around, which would be very difficult to do if I was just winging it, uh, I did using the reference. And I'll go in and clean that up as I go and make those drawings, either make them nicer or just save it for the cleanup pass. And I'll do that. So these were my keys. These were the poses that I started with. And I started with the first one. As I said, I started with the first one where he was just standing and then went to uh, this one where he's in another extreme pose and um, did not do the last one because I came up with the stabbing thing later, um, but eventually laid those keys in as well. And once I was happy with the keys, then I broke it down a little bit using the reference, just using what I know about animation. Uh, I went through and broke down the keys into smaller sections. And those are as you can see in my timeline, those are the blue ticks. So the blue tick marks represent breakdowns. That's breaking this sequence of events into smaller and smaller pieces uh, until you're eventually on one or two frames uh, in between. And that's what we call twos or ones. Um, right now, a lot of it's on threes and fours. That means there are three frames in between some drawings. And then there are even four drawings at one point. And, uh, and sometimes there's only one drawing in between, and so that's on ones. And then sometimes things are on twos, that's on twos. And twos are generally what used to be considered the amount of drawings that you would use in an animated scene. So everything was on twos in the olden days. When I'm saying olden days, I mean like Bugs Bunny cartoons, Disney stuff from the 40s and 50s. They figured out that was the minimum that they could use, uh, the minimum amount of drawings they could use to make it look as if the action was streaming continuously and not just a series of flashing drawings. Nowadays, you're more likely to see ones because a lot of animation is done digitally. And when a computer is doing your in-betweens for you, you can uh, save a lot of time you don't have to draw. And that's uh, cutout animation, CG animation, you know, three-dimensional stuff. But when you're drawing it by hand, uh, you get to make that determination. Do I want this to be on twos, on ones, on fours, on sixes? Uh, that's that's all part of the art of drawing animation by hand. So in this case, I just made some determinations as I went and decided, well, I need more space, more drawings between certain events and less drawings for other ones. So for example, now I'm going to go through this with the keys and the breakdowns and just show uh, where I'm at with it. So here's a key, here's a breakdown, and here's another key. So that a little event um, I got from the reference that the reference person who's doing this move doesn't hardly move, um, but his legs went up into the air. There was almost no anticipation in this move. And so I just 
copied and pasted the body and then animated the legs in the position that I saw. And they're a little chunky. They're not quite on model, but I was just going for the motion the first pass through. So that got me to here. And then there's another key between here and here. Thought, well, that's that's enough. I don't need another breakdown for that one. But from here to here, that's a pretty big move. And so a breakdown fits pretty nicely between those two. And again, I use the reference for these breakdowns as well as the key poses. Uh, before I went in and started adding a little bit of an animation -y touch here and there. So the first pass, I was just copying uh, the move. Now this is a really extreme move. And so to go from, if you're just looking at the keys, to go from here to here, um, that's a pretty big jump. And if you played this at speed, it would look as if these were two separate drawings that may or may not even have anything uh, to do with each other. Proportions are a little off as well. So um, to play this at speed, it would look really choppy. Uh, maybe you can even see it now as I go from one frame to the next. So add a breakdown and that breaks this action up a little bit and uh, persistence of vision makes it easier to track this foot that's sticking out uh, in front here. Um, you can see that foot a little bit better when you um, have a breakdown there. So that's why I added a breakdown to this particular bit of business. And then moving along, same thing here. Um, here are the keys. So there's a key here and one here. The character spun all the way around. Um, and because of the way our minds work and our eyes work, what you would most likely do is you'd think that this foot um, ends up being this foot because they're so close together and they look the same. So if you flip between just these two, it looks like that foot becomes that foot. And, um, and that they didn't really turn around. And so I had to put in a breakdown between the two of them where uh, the foot is actually turning. And so you see that it isn't just morphing from that shape to this shape. Let me get rid of that. So by adding a breakdown, now you can see that uh, the foot spins. So it goes from there to there to there. And that, again, that was just uh, some artistic interpretation on my part. I'll zoom in on this a little tighter so you can see. So if I'm going from here to here, well, I have to kind of decide. It's moving so fast in the reference, you can't even really see it. So I had to decide, well, what would be, using the 12 principles, what would be like a good silhouette? And it's not the best. I could probably move his arm up a little bit and clear it, and that might make it a little bit easier to read. Um, but when it's moving at speed, it looks pretty good. Uh, so I've stuck with it so far. Um, so there's a breakdown. And then like the next one, I'm not going to go through all of these, don't worry, but uh, just looking at the more complicated parts shows you the need for adding breakdowns to some of this stuff. So here's from one key to the next key. And he's flipped all the way around. He's um, turned completely around, completely the opposite of the direction he was in before. And so it's good to have a drawing in between that shows how he went sideways. And you'll see the quality of the drawing isn't that nice. I just needed to get the motion in there. Um, when I go back and clean this up, um, I might not even use this drawing. It's just a placeholder so I can flesh out the action. When this plays at speed, it's going so fast you can't even see the individual drawings. Um, but you'll notice if they're gone. And so, um, in this case, uh, I decided to add another breakdown. All right, so then we've got this one, same thing. Go from this key to this key. That's a pretty big leap, right? Uh, figuratively and literally, uh, he leaps to the ground. So to go from this key to this key required some thought and, again, looking at the reference, but he spins all the way around and he lands in this pose. If this were to play at speed, it wouldn't look right at all. It'd be very confusing and hard to read. So if you add the breakdowns, now you can see he spins around and then he lands. And you can see that I uh, labored over this drawing a lot. Uh, you can see a lot of eraser marks and um, see a lot of struggle there trying to figure out, well, how would this look best? Um, and that's part of the fun of animation is trying different things 
and seeing what uh, what works and what doesn't work. And the main thing that I was looking for was how do I make it look as if the arcs are moving in 3D properly and respecting what happened in the uh, live action reference. So there's with the um, breakdowns added. No breakdowns between this one and this one that made sense. And then um, the rest of this basically is just moving holds and in betweening things as they go into a slow in or a slow out so that uh, you get the idea that the character comes to a stop as it reaches up with his arm and then comes back down. So it had to move into a moving hold up on one side and then it had to move into a little bit of a hold on the other side and then back into a moving hold. Um, so all that has to be drawn, but I probably will do most of that in the cleanup stage. So these drawings are pretty lame, um, but that's because they're just placeholders. That's just so I can see the motion fluid, fluidly. Um, you can compare the, uh, the last drawing to the one right before the last drawing and you see that uh, there's hardly any detail at all. But when you play this at speed, uh, check out how you can actually see the animation at work, uh, even with just these lazy drawings in there. But again, it's just a, a way of getting the action in there. And then I'll go in and clean it up later. It would be very energy and time prohibitive to draw this all the way through um, at, at the uh, de level of detail that it will be at when it's done. It would take forever and it would probably still, you'd have to do a lot of fixes and change things. Another thing you might notice if you're looking at this is that I uh, squashed and stretched this arm um, because the character's moving really fast and because we're not using motion blur, I'm not using motion blur on this scene. In order to get from a place that's uh, here, this extreme, to a place that's here, I did a little bit of squash and stretch. And the idea behind squash and stretch is you don't want to see it when it's playing at speed. You probably will now because I've shown it to you. Um, but when you're watching a scene like this, the idea is you don't really see them. You feel those drawings, but you don't see them. There's another one here somewhere. I flopped his hand around a little bit so that you could see uh, his hand moving. Um, I'll probably fix this hand up too. That one doesn't, this one doesn't in between. But so his hand's gonna drag as he brings it down because his hand's moving really fast and that'll increase the persistence of vision. So his hands, I made them drag and flop around a little bit um, just so it helps sell this arc on something complicated like this, where it's a, uh, it's a really fast, complicated move, um, which again, I would never attempt that without doing, uh, using reference. So, um, so next up, once I did the breakdowns, um, then I went through and did some rough in-betweens, which is again, something that uh, used to be a job. I'm not sure now, I mean, not a lot of 2D productions probably do this full feature length animation. Uh, but back in the old days, they would have a, an assistant who would be a rough in-betweener, which is something I did for a while. Um, and you follow up an animator and you learn their style and their skill and you learn about animation while you're doing their rough in-betweens. But many times the rough in-betweens would be at this level or they'd be at this level, which is there's almost nothing there at all. The idea is to flesh out the motion so that you can see it when you're playing it at speed and it doesn't feel choppy. And so that when you do go back and do a cleanup drawing for every single drawing, uh, that you can be sure that it's going to look pretty good and you don't, you don't leave anything to chance. And so that's uh, the next step that I did with this was I uh, went through and did rough in-betweens. So if I scrub through this slowly, you'll see some of these really sketchy, scratchy drawings. Um, they were just simply there. I mean, this part I did with a little more thought because it's complicated and I'll probably still do some more. His volume changed from being this kind of cool stylized shape to this more anatomical shape. It's not even the same character. So I'll go back and fix that up uh, either when I'm rough, finishing the roughs or when I'm cleaning it up. You can't see it when it plays at speed, but it'll make a difference when it's cleaned up. It'll, it'll show more. Uh, so I went through and I did uh, a lot of rough in-betweens of just the body and filled out the action. And then once I'd done all those rough in-betweens, 
I went through and I did a pass on the hair. So I waited to do the hair last because I wanted to make sure that there were plenty of drawings included. I did lay in some things when I was keying this because I knew when he was up in the air like this, his hair would whip around. So he probably would, his hair would be up on a pose like that or this, uh, that one I definitely did later. Um, or when he was down, you know, his hair is probably going to be in a pose like that. It's just, that's because I've done this before and I kind of have a, my own language that I use. Well, it's not mine. It's a lot of people use it, um, but for how things should overlap when, uh, when hair is flopping and things like that. So I went through and did a hair pass, just a really loose pass to just give the feel of it. Um, that is not how it'll look when it's done. It'll be a lot more, I'll pay a lot more attention to the strands of hair, the clumps, um, but I just wanted to get a feel for it and to see if it was working. And then the hair bounces to a stop here and he holds for just a little bit. It's important to take pauses uh, when you're animating. You don't want the character to be moving all the time. And uh, if you've got a character slowing in to a stop, then they can stop there for a while. Uh, I have the character blinking and I have the character's hair bouncing so that you don't see the character come to a complete dead stop. Uh, but just for a couple frames, it's okay to have a character stop. And even here, I have his arm moving and nothing else. Uh, and you can get away with with something like that, uh, but not for too long or else it's gonna look like the arm's been cut and pasted and that the body itself isn't uh, animating. That, that this, again, it was just like a little bit of a cheat, which it was, I just copied and pasted the arm there. And then uh, same thing here, just fleshed it out with uh, rough in-betweens, but didn't even mess with the hair on these last poses because his hair is just gonna come to a stop and be in this pose uh, for the last frames. So that was the last step that I did as far as drawing with this character. Um, I went and did the hair and then I, I sort of plussed things, found things that were a little bit too rough so they couldn't even tell what was going on. You know, cleaned up some of the faces just to use as placeholders so I know, you know the orientation of his face and uh, can place where the hair is supposed to go. And then, you know, where's the placement of the hands when he's holding this staff in his left hand? And how is he holding the blade? Also, too, when did he pick up the blade? Well, he picked it up while he was spinning. So I just cheated that. Um, it doesn't really matter. This isn't for production, and I'm not sure anybody would know or care. Uh, but ta-da, suddenly he whips his blade out and, and is ready to go. So I'm, I guess he just had it hidden somewhere on his leg or something. I don't know. Maybe I'll draw it later. Uh, not, the, not the most important thing uh, that I'm worried about right now. But now that I've walked through it a little bit, I'll just play it again so you can see it. I'll zoom out a little so you can see it uh, full frame. So there's the action. So I just spent a lot of time playing it over and over and uh, making sure that it was doing roughly what I wanted. And I mean that. Uh, in the rough sense that this is rough animation and does it have the kind of life I have? Does it read? Is it clear? Does it play to the camera? Is it staged nicely? All the 12 principles stuff. Uh, and then of course, um, did it you know, fit in well with the background, which I showed you before. And then once I was happy with it, so play with the background again. Once I was happy with it, then I went through and I, I charted it. And so the charts are a roadmap of how I created all this. And my way, favorite way to do it is to do it after I've worked out the animation. Uh, there's some people who work it out before and use that to help uh, create their animation. But for my purposes, it's, uh, it's something I do after. And I go, okay, I'm happy with this animation. This is how I want it to look. Now I can go through and chart the thing and uh, use that for... Um, if, I, if I leave the scene and want to come back to it, if I want to go back in and lay some more animation down, if I want to clean up the stuff I've already got, well, I know which, where my keys are, my breakdowns, and what order I did everything in. And then when I go to clean it up, it's going to be really easy to go back in here and uh, figure out which drawings I should do first and which emphasis I should give to each of the drawings. You know, what's a breakdown, what's a key, what's... Uh, halfway, what's three quarters, et cetera. So 
just real quickly, it's kind of dry, so I won't spend too much time on it, but um, I created a special layer just for the chart. And went through and mapped everything in here. Turn on the color card so you can actually see it. Actually, that's probably not helping any, but anyway. So um, I went through and just charted the thing out uh, with charts like so, just good old fashioned charts. I didn't do anything fancy with it because um, I really didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. I just need to have something so that I can use this for future reference. So in this case, you can see that uh, drawing 26 was a key, drawing 32 is a key, and then uh, 27, 28, and 29 are the in-betweens with 28 having more emphasis, meaning it was uh, probably a breakdown that I did first. So if you look at 28, if I turn the hero back on, um, you'll see that the hero was halfway between this pose where the character's up in the air and then this pose where the character's down on the ground and 28's about halfway through there. And then uh, 29 and uh, 30, you know, they, they keep, keep the thing going. It looks like I didn't even chart 30. Um, so in this case, I probably would put uh, 28 on a quarter and then 30 on a quarter because there are two breakdowns between two keys. Don't worry about the math of it. Um, I'm just mentioning that this is some of the stuff you go through when you're planning this stuff out. An easier one is probably, no, I'm skipping ahead. An easier one is probably this uh, first part where you can see that the first drawing is on frame one and then the next key is on frame six. And so between one and six, I have one breakdown, which is drawing number three. I circled it because it's important because uh, one and three actually look very similar. One and three are, are pretty close except for the legs. And so I circled that drawing on my chart as a way of saying, well, pay attention to this. Don't just in between it. It's not just uh, halfway. It's not just a third. It's actually a really important drawing. And then four, which is the in-between, uh, between three and six. That one is halfway. You can see it in the chart that I created. And so the drawing itself would be halfway between this and this, which is this one. And again, I use uh, onion skinning to find these drawings, uh, to create these drawings. And by turning on the onion skinning, then I can see where I was and where I'm going. And you can turn the onion skin quality up and down and change the colors and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And we teach you how to do all those things at CG Spectrum in, uh, in our 2D program using, uh, using uh, Toon Boom. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> um, so uh, now that I've gone through and, and done the drawings, the initial drawings, turn this off. Um, and then I've charted this, so you can see, I just charted the whole thing. And um, then I moved on to the monster level. And here's where I had some fun because um, for the kind of monster I wanted to do, there's not really anything that I could use for reference other than uh, other animation because I wanted it to look really cartoony. So in this case, I used just the look and feel of monsters from Space Ace. I started out with uh, a design of a beast that would look something like a slug. And there we go. And so, um, you know, it's kind of cartoony, but it's kind of menacing as well. It's got big old fangs. And I've been very loose with this thing. I haven't uh, put a lot of thought into it just yet, other than making it a kind of a slimy slug-like creature with fangs and antenna. And then all these, um, and then all these uh, little tentacles on it. So uh, first, I came up with the design, and then did um, a little bit cleaned up version of it, and decided things like, well, where is it going to break? So um, by break, I mean where is the creature going to uh, 
be animated too. So there's a breakpoint here, and there's a breakpoint here, and then there's a breakpoint at the character's body base level, which is down here. And that just helps me define this character as being three circles. And then you can just look at it as a bouncing ball exercise where the character uh, is you know, just a matter of squash and stretch at that point. And then the character I give it at that point, uh, it's up to me to give it character just like you would a bouncing ball or, or anything. So after having defined what this thing was going to be and, uh, you know, thinking well if it's a it's like a mollusk without a shell um, then it probably doesn't have any bones it'll be really squishy and disgusting and that's going to be fun um, and then I, I said well how am i going to animate it so obviously i'd animate those three sections of the body but i decided to put the tentacles on their own level because i thought well that's just going to make life easier i'm not interested in having this react with the actual character that it's fighting it's just they're just i just want the tentacles to be moving around and undulating and being kind of gross i worked on uh, night at the museum two uh, some years ago and worked uh, did cg animation on uh, an octopus a friendly octopus and learned a lot about tentacles uh, also years and years ago i worked on shark tail and there was a lot of fish and things uh, undulating and squishing and and uh, there was a lot of uh, overlap and follow through and, and it taught me a lot about tentacles. Well, I'm not going to get too complicated. That, that's one of the reasons why I'm going to keep this one simple is because I know what it entails. And uh, when you're animating, you have to think in terms of just how much you can accomplish. Uh, and unless you're Richard Williams and you can do an entire film on once by yourself with stripes and polka dots and things. Anyway, so um, I decided to break the tentacles out into their own level and then just do something really simple with them. So they're just going to slowly undulate from one uh, shape to the other. And so for the tentacles, uh, they go from here to here. And then they'll just uh, move through that. And you'll see that in a second. They'll, they're just going to move through uh, these shapes and just sort of slime and slide and roll around a little bit and i might amp it up a little bit once i see how it looks and this is still in progress uh, so i might work on this today a little bit but uh, those were the initial key poses that i started out with so first i'll turn off the tentacles now and, and show you what i did with the body of the slug thing again i keyed this out I'm not going to go through every single key. I haven't even marked the keys yet or charted or anything. I just keyed it out, broke it down, and did a couple of rough in-betweens here and there just to kind of get a feel for it. It's probably way over the top right now. Uh, I may tone it down later, but this is what I've got so far. So the idea is this fanged slug thing uh, takes some really cartoony snaps at our hero and goes in uh, for the kill trying to bite our character and uh, and then being surprised when the character when the hero uh, actually sort of parries sort of sticks his sword at him so if i go through a little slower um, you can see so there's the bites and then he does a double bite so he bites down once and then rears up and bites down again and then uh, it's going in for another kill, but or at least it's a little bit curious. And then almost gets poked, so it rears back. And then I'm sure they just continue fighting like this until one of them goes down. So you can see I've been very rough with this. I did some really loose key poses. You can see those are the ones that are a little bit nicer drawings. Um, and then based on that then i broke it down a little bit further those are the not quite so nice drawings like this and then i went through and did some really rough in-betweens just to flesh out the action and so that's drawings like these uh, this again is a work in progress uh, so that's i thought it might be fun to just play around with this some more today um, but after having roughed this out uh, and once i had all the drawings in that i wanted um, then i went back and did the tentac uh, sorry, the uh, antenna, antennae. Um, so only after I'd already done the base body 
then I go back and address the antenna. I'd done some initial drawings, like for example, the first one, uh, maybe a couple keys here and there, like that one, because I knew when it came down, when it was going down, that the antennas would fly back. And when it goes this way, you know, the antennas are gonna go the opposite of whatever. And somebody can take that clip and turn it into a dance video, right? Um, so I knew that that was gonna happen on the keys, um, but I really waited until all the drawings of the body were in before I went in and roughed out some of the overlap and follow through. I'll play it at speed again so you can look at the antennas. And again, I wanted them to be very cartoony, very kind of over the top, campy like Space Ace and uh, Wizards and things that I liked. And then the character design itself, again, it's, it's just sort of in my style with the uh, kind of pupilless eyes and sort of and I don't even know what you call it, but it's, I, I don't even know where I got it from. I think it's a mixture of Hollywood and other things, but it's my thing is to draw characters who have these eyes that are, don't have any pupils and their mouths are kind of close. It's sort of like mushroom people or something. Maybe it's Jim Henson. I have no idea, um, but it's just it's something I'm, I enjoy drawing that way, so I do. And when you're doing animation, you want to draw something that you're comfortable and, and interested in drawing over and over and over and over again. Uh, so last week I was drawing, uh, my last couple of weeks, I was drawing a female superhero. I'll get back to that one someday. Um, but I thought this one was a little bit more immediate and fun. Uh, but again, in, in a style that I'm comfortable with, if you want to become a professional animator, you will have to learn how to draw in all sorts of styles. Uh, but usually you're drawing fairly rough and you have plenty of time to get to know a character. And so uh, you practice drawing the thing a lot before you animate it. So once I'm done with this, once I'm really happy with this motion, because I'm not 100% happy with it yet, once I'm happy with how it's working out, then I'll do the same thing. I'll go in here, I'll chart this out and uh, prepare it for being cleaned up. And then if I'm happy with the animation at that point, then it's just a matter of uh, doing a cleanup pass which is long and pretty arduous, arduous. and uh, um, can be uh, fun, but, but it it's, doesn't make for the most exciting viewing in the world. Uh, so Siren's voice, i um, not sure you are, but uh, I'm glad that you missed my stories. I'm glad I haven't uh, bored you to death with them. Speaking of which, uh, so I was talking earlier about this character's design and i forgot to mention uh, another I, i'm not 100 percent sure of this but i'm pretty sure that the original design for the characters in wizards which i referenced before and uh um, certainly space ace with toby uh with don bluth was from toby bluth um he uh, was an amazing artist who is no longer with us uh, but he drew uh, with these big floppy kind of bell-bottom feet and um, like skinny characters. And, and uh, if you look at uh, Hercules, the Disney animated film, uh, I don't know, I didn't know Toby Bluth and when, um, I didn't actually know his work until later, and actually until like about 10 years ago. Um, but somebody told me, oh yeah, yeah, that young Hercules is very indicative of the Toby Bluth style of, you know, with big clunky feet and then sort of skinny upper body and big hands and uh, big expressive Disney-ish faces. And uh, I looked at his work and he was an amazing artist, but I didn't realize that he actually had an influence on Wizards and obviously Space Ace because he's Don Bluth's brother. Um, and so it was no surprise to me uh, that all those characters had a similar look. And why I tapped into it, I don't know. It's You like what you like, uh, but I've always just liked that look. And maybe it's because it hit me at a formative age, so I expect characters to look like that. Uh, another uh, interesting tidbit, since um, someone has expressed interest in my stories, when I was working on The Swan Princess, I worked uh, with a lot of veterans, people who had worked on things when I was young, um, without knowing it. And so people who had worked on Disney films and Bakshi films and uh, all sorts of things that, that influenced my love of animation. Well, they were working right next to me on Swan Princess, uh, job to job, right? And so uh, I ended up meeting John Sperry, 
who was one of Ralph Bakshi's aces in the hole, basically. He said in his book, um, I can't remember what the book's called, but Bakshi did a book about his career. And he said, if there's anything in Wizards that is working, if there's any good animation in that film, it's because of John Sperry, who had worked on classic Warner Brothers cartoons. And, uh, you know, I've gone through the film a few times and I'm like, okay, I see what he's talking about. And so I had an opportunity to talk to John Sperry. I was about as starstruck as you could be. And he was one of the most humble people I'd ever met. And he said to me something which had always been on my mind, which is in Wizards, there are horses that only have two legs and they have these feet. Uh, their, their legs look just like this. And at a certain point, uh, the horse has to rear up and bear the character of Weehawk, which I showed you earlier, but in case you're just checking in, um, the character of Weehawk gets borne away on a horse and they go hopping off together into the sunset. And uh, John Sperry said to me, he says, you know, and I really had to stop and think about it. How would a horse that's only got two legs rear up when it's only got two legs? It would have to stand on one leg and then wave with its other legs. Hopefully you know what rearing is. It just means you lean back and you go like that. Horses can do that. And so he was explaining to me how he came up with this idea for a two-legged horse to rear on one leg and how he animated it. And I just thought that was about the coolest thing I'd ever uh, heard in my life. Well, it was one of many such cool things that I heard in my career. Uh, but that one influenced me a lot, that film and uh, even that scene. I had thought about that scene a lot as a kid. And uh, so to have the person who actually thought it out and animated it was just just uh, astounding to me and made me so happy to be in the business when I was and uh, getting to meet people like that. Anyway, so stories, I've got a million of them. Uh, maybe you have some too. Feel free to share them at any time uh, if you're interested. But uh, let's get back to this scene. And so now that I've addressed some of the stuff, the work that went into the, oh, well, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. So let's look at the tentacles and then I'll get on with it. So the tentacles, I did it on a separate level. Um, the first pass, I just animated them by themselves. And so I just uh, took the first pose and the last pose and then just did what you do with the animation, cut it in half. Um, if I make these into keys right now, I can flip, flip between them and you'll see what I'm talking about. So, so here were the keys that I worked with on this. Let's make that one a key as well. All right, so here are the keys that I worked with. So just three drawings. Um, three drawings. Thank you. Three drawings of this just sort of morphing. And uh, this is an exercise in overlap and follow through. Uh, it's something that you do a lot of if you're um, practicing animation. When you're practicing animation, it's a good idea to do stuff like this with tails, with ears, uh, with anything that has overlap and follow through and drag. And this turned out to be a really nice example of something where uh, I could practice that sort of overlap and follow through. So I broke it down and then I broke it down further into in-between drawings between those keys. And uh, as I go, I'll probably break it down even further. And like I said, make some calls about whether or not I want the, the tentacles to flip around or do anything interesting. But this is how they look right now. Uh, so this is there on fours and sixes. There's hardly any animation in it at all, at least from what you can tell. Um, maybe today what I'll do is I'll go through, that'll be really simple and fun is go through and add some in-betweens to this. And then by the end of uh, this hour, maybe even sooner, you'll see that this is going to look nice and smooth and it'll just sort of undulate. Again, after I've got all the drawings in there that I may go through straightforward and, and animate some little flips or turns uh, with the tentacles. But for now, I just want to get a steady motion. If you look at it with, uh, I'm just calling it beast for now, but if you look at it with the beast layer, um, you'll see that it just sort of morphs along with the character. Let me turn off those charts. So you can see that it 
it's just going to kind of undulate around and then eventually I'll tie it in with the character a little bit more so that it pulls and stretches. But I really just wanted to have a, a frequency of just a constant moving of those disgusting tentacles as the character's doing its thing. The main thing is, is right now there's a lot of action going on in this scene, um, maybe too much. Uh, to watch it over and over again, you get, can really analyze it. If this was in a movie or a show or a game or something, it would probably be enough just to have this character doing that. And that's about all your mind could really see. Uh, if you look at Space Ace, Dragon's Lair 2, those old 80s video games that are animated, they move like house on fire. Your eyes can barely keep up with what's happening on the screen. And then you miss a lot of the joy of animation. So to have too much going on in a scene is distracting and uh, makes it confusing and kind of ultimately kind of irritating. Uh, but in a case like this, where I'm repeating it over and over again, uh, there can be some action with both of the characters, but I may end up toning down the slug thing if it's too distracting. But uh, the goal was to not have more distractions by having the tentacles flopping and flipping and, and moving all over the place. So, um, so I kept it kind of simple. All right, so now that I've given you an overview, well, let's just play it one more time with the background. Why not? Uh, now that I've given you an overview of the scene, and need to turn off the, all the charts. Make sure that, yep. Um, now that you've uh, seen everything, now you can see how the scene might look when it's done, um, at least get a sneak preview of it. And um, again, Eventually I'll have a nicer layout, or at least one that I've designed myself, and then I'll uh, have cleaned up the characters, uh, but we're a ways off from that. So turn off the background. I'm going to turn off our hero. I'm going to lock all the layers that I'm not using so I don't accidentally draw on them, which is easy to do. And then I'm going to do some in-betweens on the tentacles and flesh them out a little bit so that you can actually see uh, how they're going to move and undulate and slide around and slop around. So having said that, um, I'm going to sort of shut up a little bit and just draw. Um, please feel free to ask any questions if you want me to start talking again. And as I think of anything relevant, I will uh, continue to add to the story, but uh, for now, I'm just going to start drawing a little bit. So check it out. And then by the time I'm done, I will hopefully have something kind of interesting to share. All right. While I'm getting started with this, what I'm going to be using a lot is uh, creating new frames. So I just go to drawings, create empty drawings, or you can go to Alt Shift R in Tune Boom. Once I've got an empty drawing, then I uh, turn on onion skin, and then I have to expand my onion skin so that I can see both of my drawings clearly, and then just go for it. And I'm drawing really, really loosely. I just wanna get this in here as fast as possible. Just the minimal amount of information I can give so I can get through all these drawings really fast and see if the motion is even working and then see what I got to change, what I must change, if anything. And I'm not really worried about how it attaches to the character. I already made that call before, uh, but I will definitely be doing that at some point. So I'm just going to do a rough pass, a uh, breakdown pass. So in fact, uh, before I even get started, I'm going to just mark some of these as keys. And then I'll mark uh, the new ones that I'm doing as breakdowns. And again, that's just for my own benefit so that I know the order I did these in. Once I've got it on twos, for example, because this is going to be on twos at least, maybe even ones in parts, uh, it'll be really easy to lose track of where, how I, where I started, how I proceeded, 
and uh, go back and replicate that when I do the cleanup pass. So it's in your best interest to do this. All right, so I'm gonna do another breakdown between these poses. And just for the record, um, if you take classes at CG Spectrum, uh, we'll often show you stuff like this, but we'll do it at high speed. So um, some people are interested in this process. Some people are not so interested in this process, but uh, the videos that we create that uh, we use for tutorials in CG Spectrum, we go through this stuff pretty quickly and give you plenty of time to practice and then look over your shoulder virtually anyway while you're doing it to make sure that you're on the right track. But here at Twitch, I'm doing it in real time just so you can see how long it might take to do something like this in case you're interested. And as I said, while I'm doing it, I, I can imagine there are certain things that you just don't think about uh, when you're doing a lesson, which you do think about while you're doing the actual business at hand. In this case, there is something kind of interesting about this. So if you look, turn off the, the onion skin. If you look at these two drawings, you can see that the center drawing, center tentacle, tentacle, the one that I'm about to draw, has changed shape radically. And uh, I was an in-between herb, well, a cleanup artist for a long time. And we had to learn how to morph things between widely varying shapes. And the answer is you don't just morph it. You don't just draw between the lines. You have to come up with sort of a, an act for the shape to do, an arc for the actual shape to go through um, based on your knowledge of you know, footage that you've looked at of arcs and things and how things move. So in this case, if I was gonna in between this, just standard verbatim in-betweens, you know, I might do something like this because that's where the lines are, right? You know, so if I did something like this, well, that's technically an in-between, right? It's the lines are going through. You can see, you know, that this in-betweens, but the problem is, is it's not organic and it doesn't look right. And if you were to see it on a screen as part of an animated piece, it would look like the, the drawings are just sort of morphing in and out. Um, without any respect uh, to arcs in volume and mass and shape. So we spent a lot of time, or I spent a lot of time, and anybody who spent time in the animation industry and worked for a living, spent a lot of time learning about how to in-between things properly so that uh, they look like they're retaining their shape. Well, hello, Gash Slug. I remember from last week. Hello. Welcome back. So, so here is one way to do it. I'm not thrilled with that. I'm going to actually do something a little different with it. Let's maybe have the, uh, the weight of the tentacle starting to pull it down. And there will be a lot of betweens between this drawing and the one after it, so that um, so I can play around with it and fix it up if needed. It's getting there. So I'm going to turn this into a curly cue and then move on to the next one. So something like this might work out. 
that you can see how rough I'm being. I'm just playing around with the shapes. And uh, I'll go through and clean all this stuff up later once I'm pretty sure that this is working out nicely. Another thing I might do is you might draw with contour lines and that'll help you track, you know, the three dimensional qualities of, of something like this tentacle. But I'm going to stick with that one for now and then I'll fill in more drawings with it later. And again, I'll look at this at speed once I've done all the breakdowns and see if I like that one or not. So now I'm going to add another one. But the idea of that last one, which I'll probably come back to, is um, you know, you're favoring one side or the other and making it a good drawing that in-betweens and not just worried about, oh, well, do the lines themselves actually in-between. That's something you learn when you're getting started is you, you can't just in-between the lines. You have to in-between the form, the shape, and uh, be mindful of the material, the volume of the thing. In this case, it's squishy gunk. Uh, so here's an example where, well, let's do that part again. I've got a situation where I've got to do an in-between between this and this shape. What do you do? Do you go straight down? Maybe in some cases you might go straight down and, and then that would you know complete an arc. But in this case, it's probably better to favor one side or the other. And I'm going to favor the side, uh, the green one, which is is uh, basically where it's going to uh, because it's bigger. But I could go the other way too. Um, I, I'll just try that just to say I did. So I could favor the other side as well and have this thing stay this way a little bit longer. And that might work too. The, the problem with that is, is it just doesn't make for a very interesting drawing. And there's not a lot of character there. So it's just absolutely halfway. And kind of like I was showing a minute ago, where it's just it's just perfectly up and down. So that's why I would go back and favor the other side, which is a little bit more interesting looking. And it'll still in between, but it'll have a little bit more character when I go and do more drawings in between those. So now you can see it just flows a little bit better. So there's another breakdown. And when I get all the breakdowns done, I'll play it again. Um, I'm not being really systematic about where I'm placing these breakdowns because it just doesn't matter. Not, not for what I'm doing right now. Um, when I've seen all the drawings, when they're all in, then I'll start making some determinations about timing. Uh, if you look at the here that I was drawing, which I'll show that again in a minute, um, I shifted things around a lot once I had all the drawings and went, okay, make it a little faster, make it a little slower, make this part hold longer. And, you know, stop thinking of it in terms of the reference I used or even rules, regulations, but how does it look? Does it look uh, how I wanted it to look? Does it have an organic feel to it or does it look not too much of one thing or another? So, at the end of the day, it's just about, um, you know, how does it look? And are you communicating the idea that you set out to communicate in the first place? And if not, then fix it. I probably have told the story way too many times, but the, the guy who taught me how to do effects and I brought my work to him and I said, it doesn't look right. I don't know what to do. And he said, well, you knew enough to know it looked bad. So, take it back and keep working on it until it doesn't look bad anymore. And that's when I realized I didn't probably want to work in effects um, because I just didn't have the eye for it. Well, what I'm doing today is kind of effects. This is a little bit uh, like how effects works, where you're not necessarily drawing um, something like a face, which is going to retain its shape and, and keep the rigidity of say facial bones or the distance between the eyes or something you're you're working with something that's undulating and moving in space and the arcs are all over the place and 
Let me see if that one worked. Fair enough. Now here we get into a little problem. I, I talk about this a lot. Um, notice how this line morphs into the line next to, in, on the next drawing, and it makes it difficult to see what's what. You got to fix those things. Now there are going to be a lot of other drawings between this one and the next one, so I could probably get away with it. But uh, I'm going to just fix it. Just say I did, and re in between it a little bit so that that doesn't maybe become an issue later. We'll go ahead and finish this one off. So again, this is going to undulate pretty slowly. So I will probably go back probably when I'm not on camera so I can try some things out and add some flips and twists and things to make it a little more interesting if it needs it. But there we go. Morphing. Mark that as a breakdown. Move on to the next one. Just a couple more of these. And then I'll uh, check out what we got. I'm not using the shift uh, disk mode for this, but I could. If I don't like drawing this angle, then I can always use Toon Boom's tool for shifting your disk by rotating it. Uh, frankly, with these drawings, I'm being really loose and playful and careless, and I don't need to have them be exact yet. When I go to clean this up, I will definitely use it. This is another one that's a little on the odd side as far as an in-between goes. So I'll flip it and look at what the action is. Not bad, but looks like this tentacle stays on the ground the whole time. So I'll fix that up. When I first started drawing in Toon Boom, I was uh, a little bit bewildered by the uh, by drawing on a Cintiq. This was probably I first started drawing on the Cintiq back in uh, 2012, and uh, I really had a hard time with it. Since then, I've, I've come to really love it. I love just the glossiness of being able to draw on a tablet. Uh, sometimes they have rougher surfaces and that simulates paper or something. That's cool too. But I just love being able to just scribble away and scratch away and you don't, you're not committed to anything. So I've really embraced it and I hope I'm going to get better and better at it as I go. Here's another one where I'm going to favor one side or the other. So there's one side, here's the other. It does this flippy action. So in between those two, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a flip as well. And then add this little section here that where the character's tentacle is coming up. And mark that as a breakdown. And then just two more. And again, this is probably the most fun uh, way to animate is a character that's very loose and squashy and stretchy and doesn't require a lot of tight in-betweening. And it has all these floppy parts <laughs> that bounce around. Um, it, just, it just is a joyful thing to be able to draw really loose like this. 
And um, one of the things that I encourage my students to do constantly is to draw like this when you're just getting started with your scene and don't get locked into drawing in a really rigid manner, which is how I did when I first started, especially when I was a cleanup artist. Uh, I would draw very tightly all day and I just was used to it. And it took me a while to get freed up and just be really sloppy with my drawings. Again, not, uh, not at the risk of doing terrible drawings all the time, but just making sure that, uh, that you keep a loose feel to your work and that you concentrate on the vitality of the drawings and not so much, at least at this stage, not so much trying to keep them on model at all times, which you go back and do later. Actually, eliminate this. It's unnecessary. And so then I can get rid of this. All right, so mark that one as a breakdown, do one more, and then we'll take a look and see what we got so far. And this is actually the last drawing. So probably add more later um, to keep it going a little bit more, but let's just see what we got for this so far. All right. And Okay, so just play it. So now you can see how it's starting to morph. You can also see how that center one's probably going to give me some problems. So I'll probably at some point, not today, but I'll uh, I'll reanimate that center one um, for this awkward area where it, it does that weird flip. Um, it's going to need more drawings, and it's I can probably have some fun with that and turn it into this flippy thing. Um, I think I should do that now just so we can see how it would work, but, but it's, um, it ain't working right now. So, uh, I will probably want to give it some thought and come up with something cool, but the other ones are working pretty well. They just got this slow gooey feel to them. And again, if I play the beast, you can see that they're not, uh, you're not supposed to spend your time looking at them. They're, it's just supposed to be there. It's supposed to be action that's happening. Uh, while the creature is doing its thing. So now the tentacles are on, uh, they're on fours mostly. And that's enough for me to be able to just say, okay, well, they're, they're definitely moving and you can see that they're undulating and that's the idea of it. And then uh, once I'm happy with uh, the creature itself, then I'll go in and animate uh, some special parts on the tentacles to make it a little more dynamic or interesting. And just because I haven't done it in a while, let's go ahead and add everything, look at the entire thing in progress. And I'm also going to save. The most important thing of all is to uh, save periodically so you don't lose all this wonderful work that you're doing. So here's how it looks with the character, with all the characters and all the tentacles and everything. And then just as a refresher, this is how it looks with just the characters and not the backgrounds. You can actually see the line mileage. So, all right, now I think it might be fun to play around with the monster level a little bit more and uh, flesh that out because it's pretty it's pretty loose right now. So I'm going to turn off the tentacles, turn off the hero guy, and uh, turn on the monster level. And just go through each one of my drawings and kind of inspect them and play them off of each other and see what's missing and what needs to be fleshed out more. 
So this is the original design. And first I'm gonna go through and mark the keys, which I haven't done yet. So here's a key, here's one. You can tell the keys I did because I spent more time on them. But I don't wanna leave that to chance. When I go back to clean this up, I wanna really understand which drawings I did in which order so that I don't uh, do them in a way that isn't nice. <laughs> So there's another key. That's definitely another key. And I do this with my students too. Um, we go through reference footage and I show them, it's like, well, no, why would this be a key? Well, because if you look at it, if this were reference, if you look at it in relation to the other drawings, it reaches this peak here and then comes back. I actually turned the tentacles off. Um, so it, it does this thing. If you picture you know, the actions here and then the actions here and another drawing and drawings here. So it takes a little arc that goes from this one to this one to this one. So that's an extreme pose. And then you're gonna fill that in with in-betweens in between that action and flesh it out a little bit more. But you're looking for any time when the character is um, Anytime when the character is hitting extreme poses uh, that are not in between other poses, then it becomes a key or an extreme. And um, I have been informed that I should remind anybody who's watching right now, if you're interested in continuing on with this, um, we're moving to a new time. Uh, starting next week, I will be uh, doing this for two hours, starting at 8 p.m. on Wednesdays, 8 to 10 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, I'll let you work it out where it is, wherever you are, if you're interested in joining again. And I will continue on with this scene and continue uh, fleshing it out and adding things and talking about eh, just doing my thing, but uh, doing it at a different time. So next week, starting next week, uh, it will be it's, it's, uh, approximately four hours from when it is right now, uh, your time, four and a half, three and a half, uh, but 8 p.m. Pacific time starting next week. And I'll mention that again at the end. All right, so I'm going through and looking at my drawings, looking for keys so I can mark them. And once I've got them all marked, then I'm going to go in and clean them up a little bit not too much, but just clean them up a little bit. And then flesh things out a little bit more, add some more drawings and keep this, uh, keep this creature up, up to the same level that the other creature is at. So this one's not a key, it's a breakdown. So I want this ultimately to look as fleshed out as the other one does with the, the superhero kid, he's almost done. He's almost ready to start cleaning up. In fact, um, I may just start cleaning him up as I'm going. So you can at least see uh, what the character looks like when it's all finished. But, you know, mess with this one just for a little bit longer. And by uh, Focusing on each one of these keys, you get to see what the keys are in this scene. And these are the actual drawings that I started out with. Um, so I'll play those for you in sequence, just the keys. And you can see how I started with this. And then I'll add the breakdowns like I did with the other one. All right, so that's the last one. And I have one stray drawing. I'm just gonna delete that. I'm not using this one anymore. All right, so those are the keys. I'm gonna go ahead and save. Control five, but I'll just do it on screen as a reminder that you should save always. All right, so these are my breakdowns. I went ahead and did them. Uh, here you can see a little bit of exaggeration that I put on the character's face because it's moving very quickly from this pose to this one. This is an exaggerated pose too. The character is squished a little bit. Um, it's very rubbery, so I want it to squash and switch, stretch and morph um, like a disgusting slimy slug thing. 
um, but I had done those uh, squash and stretch things in the keys because I knew it was going to have it. Um, I may hide them with other drawings eventually, but for now it's okay that they show. So, room breakdowns. More breakdowns. And then, like I said, I'll play this through and show you the keys at speed and the difference between the keys playing at speed and then the keys with the breakdowns. And then I would go through and I would start in betweening this and adding more drawings in between some of these more uh, extreme poses. All right, so there we've got the keys. So now I will just click through and show you the keys themselves. So this is what I started with. These are the drawings that I started the scene with. If I go through a little more slowly, I just wanted to go through it kind of quickly so you can see it moving, so you get an idea of how it's supposed to be moving. But if I go through a little more slowly, um, you can see that was my starter pose. That's you know the character on model, more or less. And then um, this is an extreme moving back, moving forward, taking a bite, recovering from that bite, rearing up to bite again, and taking another bite, rearing back to think for a moment and reconvene, and then dodging a sword, and then going into a final pose. Um, that last one was just, just sort of a final pose. It's a good rule of thumb not to complete an action within a scene. Uh, most actions are a continuum. They started they, they were going before the before the uh, scene started and then they can continue going after the scene started because you'll cut. Um, so this, one of the reasons it, it may look better when it plays at speed is because it was meant to keep going. Not a loop per se, but, but to keep moving as if it had started before you joined us uh, in the scene or we joined the scene and we'll continue on after the scene is over. So now let me uh, bring the hero in and you can see, because I actually did use the hero character when I was setting up the, the keys for the monster. So here's frame one. So the idea was, is as the dude's doing his little turn, the monster is uh, making its initial attack. And obviously the kid doesn't really care. He's too busy doing his martial arts pyrotechnics. Um, so the monster, which is kind of stuck on the ground because it's big and fat and slimy and has big tentacles, uh, it, it makes a couple jabs, but doesn't really achieve anything. And then our hero, who is not afraid of anything, um, goes ahead and makes an attack. And then the monster finally reacts and says, uh, oh no, please don't stab me. I'm made out of squishy stuff, not even though I've got fangs. And so if I play this at speed, well, now let me add the breakdowns. So then if I watch it with the breakdowns, now you can see I fleshed it out a little bit more. So these are just drawings in between my keys that flesh the action out a little bit more. And again, using the original character and then also using the background, you know, but I did that when I keyed it, but trying to keep the character within its space of action so that it isn't uh, moving too closely to our hero. And then if you play it at speed, uh, these are all the drawings. So it looks like the only part that's kind of problematic right now is that the biting, the biting happens really fast. Uh, there are not maybe enough drawings. Um, and also the drawings are so rough that they don't, uh, the persistence of vision doesn't quite work because it's really off model when it goes in for a bite. Um, I haven't, I didn't spend a lot of time making all these drawings sweet. Um, and I don't think I'll do that today, but what I will do today is uh, just flesh the action out a little bit and you'll see that it's going to look a little more smooth as a result of uh, adding more drawings, um, which is always fun and interesting. So I think I'll start with, start with this one, where it goes from a shut mouth to an open mouth. 
So for the shut mouth, I want to favor the shut mouth in the first place um, so that it looks as if it's, you can see the teeth longer. And so you really feel the impact of the teeth chomping down. So right now, um, if I leave it as it is, you see the, the teeth chomping down for two frames, but I'm gonna add another drawing. And so you still wanna see the teeth chomping down for, for at least another frame, um, but the mouth is starting to open up a little bit and that will make it look as if it's the, the action is continuing on. So I really drew this stuff rough. Uh, ordinarily, I would probably go back and clean this up before I'd start doing all these in-betweens, but I just want it to be interesting. Uh, I want to show this really quickly. So just a few lines here and there to show you uh, how what a difference it'll make to have even just another couple of drawings here and there thrown in. And then I can see the action better and then I can make some determinations. Of, oh, is this working? Do I need to go back and rethink it? What's going on? So just, just quick in between like that. And then I'll do another one from here to here because that's a really big jump. I don't want to put this whole thing on ones and I don't think it's, it's going to need to be on ones, but a jump like that is really extreme. And I might do a, a stretch frame here to compensate for the fact that it's moving so, so far. So I'll create a new drawing and then I will create a stretchy face, which is always fun. So from here to here, it's gonna stretch the mouth and the eyes. And these antenna are really being pulled and pushed by uh, by the forces of the thing as it's moving so quickly. I'm just gonna block this in. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, again, I go back and I tie this down a little bit better once I know it's working. Uh, but just for fun, just to show uh, just to show the process. I'll do these loose drawings and flip through a little bit. Looks like I shut the mouth too much. The thing about um, Toon Boom, the thing about doing, using the onion skin is if you only have one or two frames, then the onion skin isn't very strong. You can turn the onion skin brightness up and down. I have it pretty low. Um, because I'm a believer in uh, flipping. Oops, totally doing it wrong. Uh, I, I believe in flipping your drawings, and that's that's the way I learned how to do it. Is you flip more than you use onion skin, which certainly in something like this where it's it's an action, and you're trying to get the. I've said this before. I'll say it over and over. But you're trying to get the. You're trying to draw while you're flipping things. You're trying to actually draw while it's moving. If you could draw in space while the character was moving, that would be ideal. But uh, since you can't do that, then you just have to keep flipping your drawings. All right, that's fair enough. Okay, so even a section like that, I'm just gonna play it now and see if that made any difference at all, just to have those mouth chomps. So you can kind of see already that it's it's just, you can just see that the mouth chomps a little bit better. And again, it, ideally you probably would want to put this whole section on one and I may end up doing that like from here to here, that, that definitely could use one more drawing. Uh, so maybe next time when I come back, maybe all this will be on ones and you can see the difference. Uh, if you were to compare it to the old version, you'd see that it's a lot more smooth as a result of putting it all on ones. The problem is, when you put things on ones, that means you just doubled the amount of drawings. This is like, I think it's 68 frames, 68 frames total. And so there's two characters. So multiply 68 times two. And that's how many it'd be if you were actually drawing every single frame. Uh, cut that down for parts that are on twos, threes, and fours, and then your life just got a little bit easier. But if it doesn't look good, then you've lost. So um, 
sometimes it's just essential to actually do things on loans, especially for sections like this, where uh, the thing is moving really, really fast. And there's no way for your eye and your brain to keep up with it. Persistence of vision will not carry the day. And it looks like a series of separate drawings that are strobing and not like something that's one character animating. So far from being my best drawings in the world, but, um, but let's just look at how it's morphing. So now you can see it's, it's, if you play it a little faster, it's starting to feel a little more loose and more rubbery and, and not quite as rigid as it was. So I'll do a few more of these and then we'll move on. That one's not bad. That one's a good one. That's one that definitely needs from here to here. From there to there, it definitely needs more because uh, those drawings are so extreme. Uh, I don't want it to lose the snappiness of it. So I'm going to favor the drawing that's red, uh, which is where it was coming from, rather than the one that's green. But at least there'll be another drawing in between these two. but you can see how loosely I'm doing it. And I would draw like this when I was doing 2D with paper too. What you'd use is you'd use a, like a charcoal pencil or a blue pencil, um, like a colored pencil of some sort uh, to give you a really loose line and to encourage you to not draw clean because you're wasting your time if you're drawing something like this too tightly. Uh, you're getting in and, and jumping the, putting the cart before the horse if you're drawing tightly at this stage when you haven't even worked out the timing of it yet. There you go. That's, that wasn't bad. I just put in the uh, antenna. When I say it wasn't bad, I mean it's it's not a good drawing, but it's it's not so bad that it doesn't even look like it's in between. That's move those up a little bit. And again, I could amp up the onion skin on this, but I really don't care. It's it's not going to make or break it. This is the overall action I'm looking for. So, all right, I'm going to play this at speed, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time doing a little bit of cleanup work on the lead character. So now you can just see that the, the bites are a little bit easier to read. If I zoom in on the character itself, maybe you can see a little better. And it's enough for me to work with. Um, I'll go back and I'll do a cleanup tie down pass on this uh, later when I'm not on camera. <laughs> I'll do a tie down of this, do the charts for it, and then just make sure that nothing's missing. You know, make sure all the volumes of the head stay relatively the same. They're shifting around too much right now. The head changes its volume a lot, and the body does too. But it squishes all right, and the action itself is all right. And that's what I was trying to accomplish with this pass. And I probably maybe another couple drawings here and there, but when it's shifting around in here, uh, this this section probably could use a few more drawings, but I'll, I'll do that another day. Um, that's a little choppy, but uh, just a few more drawings to flesh that out and it'll look smooth again. All right, so then the last thing I'm gonna do with the time we have today is I'll do uh, some cleanup work on the lead character because some of these drawings are pretty, they're pretty tight already. And it's, it's fun to look at something, how it's going to look when it's finished. And with this character, at least, it's going to be a pretty fast cleanup. Um, so I will uh, put the character on its own level. And then I've already created a drawing level for cleanup. And it's all set up and ready to go. So I'll just knock this out. Um, first things first, I want to light my character up a little bit. Uh, because he's so dark, it's going to be difficult to put a dark line on him. And in fact, I'm not even going to put a dark line on him. I'm going to put a light line um, on parts of him anyway. And so I'll knock it down and, and opacity to about 40%. And then you can see that now he's a little bit lighter. In fact, 
I think 30% is going to work out even better. So I'll light them, lighten them up to 30%. Just take a double check here. That's pretty good. So now I can apply a cleanup pass to this. So because I'm planning on having this character in, um, uh, the character's going to be dark. Um, it's going to be wearing black clothes and dark colors um, and then have these pops for the eyes and for the hair of like, I think green or something really wild. Um, I'm going to draw with a light gray color and uh, that'll make it easier to see when I go in and uh, assign specific colors to it. Let's see if I remember what gray is. I absolutely don't remember. I think, I think, um, so colors for red, green, and blue. I, I know it's like two something for gray. Uh, I was wrong. It's like 130 something. So I just entered a value of uh, around 100 something uh, into the palette for red, green, and blue. And then that's how I came up with a gray color. As you can see down here on the right side of the screen, you get certain palette colors. Um, out of, right out of the box, but uh, they're they're pretty limited. And I actually I did this wrong. I changed black to something else. Didn't want to do that. So I want to create a new palette and then assign it a color. Um, this is all stuff that you learn if you take our classes. And <laughs> just just you know, and then um, make it into a gray color, and then do what I was just doing. All right, so. Let's try with let's try 150 this time for red, green, and blue. I never learned this. I just have done it a few times, and that's how I figured out. Oh yeah, yeah, it's something like that. And then uh, I can always change the colors up as I go. Okay, so there's a nice gray color. I'm going to uh, change my pencil to see how thick it is right now. I'm gonna make it level. So right now it's matching the actual color of, of my um, pencil. So the background is matching the color of my pencil. So maybe what I'll do is I'll draw it in black and I'll change it later. I'm just gonna do a little bit of this right now anyway, not for anyone who's interested in cleanup. We're almost out of time. So I'm just gonna get it started and then do it uh, off camera. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. But uh, I like to bump up the smoothing, at least when I'm getting started. So I'll smooth it out to 25. That length is about right. That's the thickness. And then I'm just going to go for it. I'll just start drawing lines. Not there. Haven't decided whether or not his staff is going to actually have any volume or not. Um, I'll decide that some other day. Now, right now I have a line join on, so I'll turn that off. Um, line building is something you can use. Uh, I, I'll show you this real quick. Um, if you turn line building on, uh, you can draw a line and then another line will attach to it. So right now, let's see if it's on or off. Yeah, so right now the lines are wanting to attach to each other because I've got the line building tool on. If I turn it off, and I draw two lines that are close together. They won't try to attach to each other. If I turn it on and I have two lines that are close to each other, they do try to attach to each other. Let's see if I can do it this way. There we go. So they, they kind of hook up with each other. So for this, I'm going to turn it off. And just draw his foot. This do the hand, it's fun. Yep. 
There we go. So the hand from this angle. And ordinarily, it probably would fill in the backs of his glove, but since he's like that, but since he's small, it's just one more thing to worry about, and no one's ever going to know the difference. So, um, if it becomes a thing later, then maybe I'll add some glove lines to him. But again, I'm just doing this one for fun, and I'll probably go back and redo a lot of this later. But this is how I would go in and clean this thing up eventually. Um, this leg I would get from the other leg. But I'm just going to rough it in for now. What's interesting is to think that this is, we've kind of gone full circle. This is how they used to do it in the old days. They would draw on plastic sheets and then turn them over and paint them. And then we changed that and we turned it into cell Xerox and you draw on paper and then they would uh, use your actual drawings, um, but Xeroxed and then zapped with colors. And then now we're back to inking things ourselves again. It's kind of interesting. We've got about 10 minutes, as always. Um, if anyone has any questions, thoughts, concerns, comments, um, we love to hear them. It's uh, part of the fun of having had a lot of experiences in the business that um, I do have a lot of um, yeah, a lot of a lot of things that I've learned that you just don't find them in books. You find uh, these things by um, talking to people who worked in the industry, and everybody I know who worked in the industry has all these great stories about famous animation people we worked at uh, with um, at the different studios we worked at. And I'm in awe of some of my peers and mentors and some of the experiences they've had, some of the people they've worked with, some of the things they've worked on, and. Um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that stuff isn't collected in books. It's just an oral history that we we kind of take for granted. Those of us who worked in the business, uh, you just got kind of get used to it. I'm gonna turn the smoothing down on the face a little bit. And it's a shame to think that some of those stories, you know, will go away sometimes because nobody keeps the torch burning. And I'm very encouraged by my students who are interested in 2D and who want to know 
about the history of it, as well as what they're currently interested in. I wasn't like that when I was a kid. All I wanted to know is what I was interested in. But I, a lot of my students are very excited about stuff that's happening in animation now, but also stuff that's happening that led up to where we are now. And uh, that's encouraging because otherwise it'll go away with the people who created it in the first place. Probably gonna cheat these brows on the masks and make it look like they're a little heavier, even though the whole thing's gonna probably be dark, black or blue. You won't see his eyelashes, but I'm just used to drawing eyelashes that are tapered. <laughs> and I'm gonna go in and really get finite with this. Um, probably my best bet would be to draw a, use a, um, a circle, uh, use one of Tin Boom's shapes, like a, an ellipse. Um, you know, I could create an ellipse and then stick it in there and then uh, make an eye like that. But I'm kind of a purist. And I like just going in and doing it. And then I can always fix it up later if I need to. But I'm kind of used to just going in and laying down a circle in the shape that I wanted it to be in the first place. And that makes it a little bit more organic. So um, it would take me longer to actually go in and lay it in the lips than just draw this stupid thing. So there's his face and then His hair is kind of in an awkward position right now, so, and I haven't really worked out the finite details of uh, how I want to break up his hair, so I'm just going to rough it in. There we go. And bring that pencil line up. So, like I said, I won't do it now, but. Um, when I'm off camera, I'll go in here and I'll make some decisions about the line quality, uh, the line colors, and which colors I want to keep black, and then which colors I want to make into a different color. And that will make a determination of how long it takes me to do this. So one of the reasons I'm doing this now is to say, okay, well, this is how long it took to draw this character once. Now multiply that by, you know, 60, roughly, and that's how long it's going to take me to draw the scene. I can cut and paste a lot, but a lot of it I can't. And uh, I'm not even fixing these drawings up. These are just, this is just my rough pass of the drawings. And then I'll go in and I'll clean it up like so. I'm using the cutter tool to get rid of straight lines and things. Um, but let's just look at it right now. So there's just a simple cleanup clean up line drawing of the character as it'll eventually look. If I turn off the uh, the hero rough layer, you'll see it's going to look something like that. And I always am a little sad when I see the cleanup version because it never has the vitality that the rough version has. But that is why um, you make sure that your animation drawings are really rough and loose. That's why I was drawing so roughly so that when I do go in here and draw tightly, and again, next week, this will, I'll spend more time on this and it'll, you'll see what a real cleanup drawing is going to look like. But at least you get to see the process of it. But that's what I'll eventually be doing to this scene for each and every single one of those uh, drawings of the character. Um, and I might be doing it on Twitch. Depends on if people want to talk or if they just want to watch me do stuff. But um, that's, uh, that's the cleanup process, or at least part of it. All right, so now to finish up, I'm just going to turn everything back on, show it a couple more times, and um, then call it a day. So first I'll run it with the background again, so you can just see the context, and then I'll turn the background off and you can see it a little more clearly. And then I'll save it, run this off as a movie, look at it, you know, take a break, step back, come back and look at it some more, and then you know, decide where to go next. Let me just turn the hero dude on. 
so he's not quite so translucent. There we go. Okay, so there we go, the scene in progress. Um, tune in next week and I will have fleshed this out a little bit more and I'll probably be in the cleanup stages or I'll be working on the tentacles. I might do some more of that next week um, or maybe some of the monster next week or maybe some cleanup. But uh, it's been great having some people chime in. Thanks for hanging out. And if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, don't hesitate to ask them. And I look forward to seeing uh, anybody who shows up next time, which again will be at a new time. I will be going from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Wednesday nights, Pacific time, starting next week. But uh, thanks again for joining me. Hope you have fun, and uh, we'll see you next time.